Hello, everyone. And welcome to the webinar, Who Decides What is a World-Class University with Michelle Elstack. My name is Michael Todd, and I'm the editor of the Social Science Space website, where Michelle is one of our bloggers. Since we know you're interested in today's topic, make sure you take a look at, bodies, uh, at Michelle's body of work on related topics at Social Science Space. Now, let me begin by introducing you to our guest before we start the conversation with her. Michelle Elstack is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Studies at the University of British Columbia. She's also the author of Global University Rankings and the Mediaization of Higher Education. Her research interests include, as you would expect, university rankings, but also the role of the media in policymaking process using multimedia technology as part of research, community, and youth engagement, social justice, and equity in education. Last year, she was an invited scholar at SMDT Women's University in Mumbai, working with students and faculty on media representations of mental illness and community-based projects to challenge stigma. As I mentioned, she also writes a popular blog for Social Science Space and contributes weekly as a commentator on the Roundhouse radio show, Sense of Place. Now, this one-hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. Now, if any of you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box on the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you SAP. At the end of the webinar, or actually at the end of uh, Michelle's uh, prepared remarks, we'll have time for Q&A from attendees. So please also use that Q&A box to ask any questions speakers throughout the webinar. You can ask while Michelle is speaking, but again, we won't get to them until after she's done with the prepared remarks. And please also take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. We will be monitoring it during the event. Now, let's hear from Michelle. Hello. Uh, thank you for coming to the webinar, and a special thank you to Michael Todd and Tiffany Medina from SAGE for organizing uh, the webinar. I'm just going to put myself in full screen here. Uh, sorry. Oops. There we go. Great. Um, so in this webinar, I'm going to talk about rankings, who decides, how is world-class status de uh, determined, what's the impact of rankings, and are there alternatives? So the focus of my book, um, I, was, uh, I drew on a growing body of research that demonstrates issues with popular rankings, including methodological flaws, the colonial underpinnings of rankings, how universities often gain rankings, and the lack of attention to equity in students. One thing that I found was a gap in the literature was a focus on the role of media. Um, so I look at the role of media, um, that the role of media plays in rankings, and how universities respond to rankings through websites, legacy, and social media engagement. My data sources. Uh, I look at public information available at QS, Times Higher Ed websites, and the ARWU. I also looked at financial websites that had information about those companies. Um, and in this uh, presentation, just because of time, I'm going to focus on the QS and the Times Higher Education uh, ranking. I also looked at websites uh, that were uh, 13 websites of top-ranked universities, top-ranked by these three rankers in Canada, China, India, South Africa, the UK, and the US. And I chose to look at countries that are at the very top of the world rankings as well as ones closer to the bottom. Uh, and I also interviewed senior public uh, affairs staff, I should say, uh, in uh, research intensive universities in Canada. And there I was looking at what is the role uh, of rankings um, in their, their work and in how they talk about uh, their university. So uh, here is an example. I just took the screenshot yesterday from the QS. And this gives you uh, what they rank as the top six uh, universities. So good, I could fit on the, the screen easily. Um, and what you'll see here is you'll see these stars. So you see like five stars. So with QS, um, universities can actually pay um, to go through a QS process to get one to five stars. Um, and so you'll see that later on when I talk about universities that are not uh, so highly ranked. And so universities that aren't ranked at all by QS um, um, that aren't in the top top thousand can um, actually pay QS uh, to be rated uh, to get a star rating. 
And so here we have the Times Higher Ed. Now you notice the universities in the Times Higher Ed and the QS are quite similar. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit later. Uh, and then here's the, the universities that are in their, the bottom of their, their list. And so at a certain point, they don't start ranking one, two, three, but just go by category. So we have 701 plus here. And so you'll note that the universities I showed you that were top ranked are English uh, speaking. And here we have universities, many of them, that uh, would not uh, speak English as the first, first language um, and that are not in North America um, or necessarily Western Europe. Uh, and you'll also notice um, the rating here uh, of a couple of universities, meaning they've paid to be rated, uh, and they're rated you know, as having two stars or, uh, or three stars. Okay, and uh, here's Times Higher Ed, and you'll notice a similar thing in terms of countries um, that are uh, not in the UK, US, Australia, uh, or Canada. So one of the things that, that got me really interested in is looking at how differences, e.g. a university's mission, or their histories, or their context are turned into hierarchies. Um, okay, and so I look at this through the concept of mediatization. So by mediatization of society, Hajar talks about that mediatization of society, we understand the process whereby society to an increasing degree is submitted to or becomes dependent on the media and their logic. The process is characterized by a duality in that the media have become integrated into the operation of other social institutions while they have also acquired the status of social institutions in their own right. This concept really interested me. I mean, one of the reasons I got into this topic was that I noticed at meetings at the university, there was often congratulations about we're up in the rankings, and I started to wonder, okay, what are these rankings, and what uh, and are these rankings, um, what are the academic fields or academic theories or concepts or methodologies that that particularly the corporate rankings draw on? And I just thought that was a cute little comic there. Okay, and so to answer that question, uh, first I looked at the Times Higher Education World University Ranking. And so if we look at who owns the Times Higher Ed World University Ranking, so we start with TPG. It's a real estate uh, is a company, it's private equity, it has uh, manages $70 billion. It has holdings in, in consumer and retail, financial services, and real estate. Uh, and they... Um, that then under uh, TPG is TES Global, and this is just from their Twitter feed. They're an ed tech company. Um, they own things like uh, Share My Lesson Plan, uh, Wikispaces, uh, Blend Space, a number of different tech products, and also um, boards for hiring uh, temporary teachers, uh, uni jobs. They have a number of, of different holdings. And then um, the same company, we have World University Times Higher Ed World University Rankings. And here we see that there's a number of spin-off products. Um, so there's the Times Higher Ed World University ranking, but there's also um, the a new ranking they have, U.S. College rankings um, with a paper that they're um, aligning with, the Latin American rankings, um, et cetera. And in addition, they have consulting services, um, including branding solution, hiring solution, where they give advice to universities on how to improve their, their rankings. This is something actually that's been really interesting since my book has come out is the number of academics I've had, particularly from, from universities that are not ranked but want to be ranked, um, and, and their, the money that their university is spending in terms of consulting, consultants to help them with branding um, and other, um, uh, other ways of hopefully increasing their ranking. So here we see the student and universities is just a, a part of a suite of consumer products. For QS, uh, QS also has a number of products, um, including the ranking. They also have best cities. And this is one thing I should say is, is, um, is the town and gown branding. Um, and in talking to public affairs directors, they talked about this as well, is they're working to brand the university, but also to brand the, the city. Um, both uh, both rankers um, put on expensive put on conferences that are quite costly. Um, again, QS also offers the QS Star product um, to universities. So, um, oh, and I should have done that as I went through. Sorry, we'll just do that quickly. Hopefully, nobody will get a headache. 
Okay. All right. Okay. So then I wanted to know who who um, are on the advisory boards of the rankers. Um, so for the Times Higher Ed, uh, we have Baroness Morris. Um, she's a, a conservative. Um, I think the head of the Middle East Council for the Conservatives and a tra trade envoy. Right Honorable David Willits was uh, Minister of Science and Universities, um, and was very keen around privatizing and um, and looking at the performance of university. Um, through uh, student indicators uh, um, and, and uh, sort of performance in, in um, the job market uh, and very keen on privatization. Lord Poopman is a movie producer. He produced Chariots of Fire. Um, also, I believe, a trade envoy, Lord Adonis, um, similarly. Uh, and Owen Lynch, who is involved in the, in, has been involved in um, consulting on ed policy in the ed business. And then we have the QS advisory. Um, uh, and so again, you know, what I'm looking at here is how knowledge should be represented, who's, who's making those decisions. And I'm not saying that these advisory members are intricately involved in the indicators, but are say something about what the corporation um, sees as, as worthy knowledge and worthy producers of knowledge. So in the QS advisory, we have uh, three women and 26 men. Uh, this gives you a sense of where they're from. Uh, predominantly in business and management or in STEM fields, science, tech, engineering, and math. Um, you have five people in the uh, industry, the education industry, uh, journalist, um, and the, the uh, uh, person that, that uh, um, is the head of QS uh, as well, a journalist. And I should say QS and Times Higher Ed were one ranking. Uh, and then had a breakup and became two rankings. Uh, all the academics in the senior, uh, in, in, uh, on the advisory are in senior admin positions. So how is excellence measured? Uh, so excellence is measured um, by, in, in the case of the Times Higher Ed, they're looking at teaching. Uh, so that would include faculty staff ratio. Um, uh, number of doctoral students and undergrads. Uh, now, this this indicator has been critiqued in terms of um, gaming of the system. Frank Brunei, in particular, in the New York Times, has talked about some of the gaming that happens in the rankings and how numbers can be um, are sometimes played with in rankings. Um, research citations, international outlook, for example, number of international students, and industry income. For the QS, um, you have uh, um, academic reputation and employee reputation. So 50% of this is based on surveys uh, and students' faculty ratio, citations, um, and ratio of uh, international faculty and students. Uh, so again, there's been a number of critiques about reputation surveys, uh, and this connects to which universities have the money to be constantly be brand and be um, visible. Uh, and that, that, that visibility then influences uh, the, the responses on reputation surveys. Now I should say both of them use Elsevier um, as their citation index uh, to determine research productivity. And this has been sharply criticized, Elsevier has been sharply criticized in terms of uh, pr price gouging, um, that they're making profits. Um, some that I think Heather Morrison from the University of Ottawa spoke of rivaling Apple. Uh, Elsevier also offers editing services and translation services uh, because what they capture is in English. Uh, and so there's growing pressure, which has also been something that a number of scholars have, have noted um, on scholars to write in English and to write about things that will be of interest to Global North editors uh, to, to in English-speaking journals uh, because their universities want to increase in their rankings. So one of the things I, I noticed is in, in looking at um, the websites uh, is a few things. One is the focus on branding tradition, and this is something that's suggested in a lot of higher ed marketing magazines is to have the traditional academic quad, but also to brand lifestyle. Uh, so here we you know, see the, the slow river pool um, and universities that are marketing all sorts of uh, amenities, uh, and to actually de-emphasize you know, um, uh, people in the library or studying, but to, to emphasize lifestyle. Uh, fame is an important part of reputation. Uh, actually, in the ARWU ranking, which I'm not going to get into here, 
Uh, one of the indicators is the number of Nobel faculty, Nobel Prize uh, winners on faculty or in alumni. And so what this leads to is that the need for constant visibility, whether it's earned media um, or paid media, um, and whether it's on their own websites uh, or through speaking to legacy media, by that I mean newspapers, uh, television, or uh, through social media. That there's a constant pressure for visibility, particularly around when r ranking um, rankers send out reputation surveys to uh, high schools and other academics. So I constructed a bit of a, a table, a construction, I want to be clear, this is not what I'm saying are winners and losers, but the construction of winners and construction of losers. So construction of winners in rankings, in the, in the popular rankings, um, that are, and the popular rankings are mainly media and corporate um, products. Uh, the construction of winners is they write in English, um, the construction of losers is they publish in languages other than English. The winners accept an elite Western model for defining uh, world-class education. So in other words, accept that the pinnacle um, of education is a Harvard or an Oxford. Um, they research, the losers research questions based in regional and national contexts. So I was speaking to an academic recently um, from Eastern Europe saying that, that you know, he has a colleague that previously was nationally respected, but his, his, the respect for him has gone down because he doesn't publish in English um, and the university is putting him under increasing pressure because that's the, that's the capital, the cachet needed. Um, construction of winners, the institutions are wealthy re relative to other higher ed institutions regionally or internationally. And the construction of the losers is that they serve predominantly poor working and middle class students and don't have large endowments. Winners um, tend to focus in the STEM areas. They might engage in community-focused research, but the metrics used in hiring, tenure, and promotion mirror ranking metrics. On the other side, you see uh, they might engage in community research, liberal arts, and social justice work. They spend time in relationship building, engaging outside of the university, and often the research is not seen as newsworthy. Um, they have Again, on the construction of winners, they have the resources to constantly reinforce their brand. National, international visibility is high. On the other hand, on the other side, is you, they can't afford to constantly reinforce their brand, or they choose to use their their resources to mitigate inequity and provide for students. And just a quick note on this is, you know, looking at the growing number of students that use food banks, and that rankings don't measure things like inequity or access. The popular rankings, I should say. Um, the construction of winners is they hire celebrity academics that bring in fame needed to maintain visibility. And on the other hand is they, don't, they can't afford the Nobel Prize winners or they choose to hire more uh, faculty for the, the money um, that can teach. Now one thing I find really interesting that did get me curious about rankings is the number of times I hear people say, particularly academic leaders, that they know uh, uh, popular rankings lack rigor, but then they use rankings to promote um, the brand. And I understand this. Universities have faced massive cutbacks and they're looking for international students. Uh, nonetheless, it is a contradiction um, to be promoting them while admitting that they um, are in many ways antithetical to any kind of academic research or ways of thinking. Uh, they may attempt or feel pressure um, to find a specialty ranking to demonstrate exceptionality. Um, the language of rankings in the construction of the winners pervades hiring, tenure, and promotion decisions in graduate student admission and awards. It might pervade, on the other side, um, to try and increase rankings. And this is something Alan Hazelcorn talks about, is that although only 90, about 98% or sorry, 98% of universities are not ranked, rankings still impact them in many ways in terms of funding, resource allocation, um, and um, the, the increased pressure to try and find a niche and be seen ex as, as exceptional in that area. But it does, it does impact them in terms of admissions. Um, the, the, on the winner's side, they buy products and services to maintain or improve their ranking, including Insights, which is from Thomson Reuters, and um, allow, uh, it is uh, sold as a product um, that helps uh, administrators make decisions about hiring and tenure and promotion. And actually that uh, product has been bought by another company. Um, 
They may purchase services, uh, con the, the construction of the losers such as QS stars. And finally, there's a focus on lifestyle, hope, and being exceptional. And for the construction of losers is the criticism I've heard is that they don't have a co coherent or appropriate brand. So um, I think there's a, a few concepts that are useful here. Um, the research, there, there's extensive research that points to rankings increasing in equity um, that, that look at how, univer how, how policymakers are often wanting a university to be highly ranked and will give more resources to that university, which means less resources for universities that are often the ones that are serving uh, poor working class or middle class students. The concept of coloniality, I think, is interesting here, is looking at the logic of colonialism and how it continues through the assumption that Western education represents progress and modernity. And this naturalizes material inequity in what Santos calls cognitive imperialism, or cognitive injustice. So it's not just a matter of having visible differences on boards, um, but diverse goals and perspectives that facilitate the mission of universities to expand knowledge and ways of knowing. The process of mediatization makes visible long-standing narratives of modernity and meritocracy while making invisible the ideologies, including the economic interests, in determining who and what is world class. So finding alternatives. Um, so I think part of it is, is uh, engaging media in diverse publics, that I'm particularly interested in increasing the engagement of public and in, uh, the public and their desire to fund public education. And I'm reminded of a speaker that came to my class who is a former minister of education and started by saying to the class, I don't have kids in school, why the heck should I care? You know, tell me why I should care. And her point was, stop just talking to each other, get out there and engage with people in terms of why this institution is part of their community. Um, and so I think that Part of it is facilitating those debates, particularly facilitating those debates uh, with people that are often marginalized in universities, media, and politics. And so the, um, the maleness and the whiteness that I, that I showed on the advisory um, boards is, is also you see in universities. And so I think part of it is expanding those debates so there's a sense of the university as being about community. I think questioning assumptions about worthiness and unworthiness of research and people that are based in rankings. I know I've been in discussions where there's talk of, oh, this person looks good, but they're from this university, meaning not a highly ranked university. Um, Ellen Hazelcorn, again, has looked at how um, academics, uh, how academic leaders in, at, in African universities talked about how it was difficult to find collaborators in the global north because they wanted to collaborate with people of similar, um, similar rank. I think questioning the separation of excellence, equity, and justice. Now, I'm, how we can have equity um, and talk about, how we can have excellence and talk about a university being world class and not have diverse forms of knowledge which requires equity, um, I'm not clear on. And so I think part of that is, is questioning um, the decoupling of those. Uh, looking at the medium and long-term impact on education systems, and so, and this is there's been compelling research about this is that having the, the sense of of one world-class university in a country or in a region, and what does that do to the other um, other universities? What how do they um, fare in that if resources are already given to relatively wealthy universities? Um, I think that finding sound measures, I'm not against metrics whatsoever, um, but looking at metrics um, that engage uh, diverse communities. What would it look like to have metrics that engage indigenous communities, for example? And looking at um, how rankings can detract from research that should be slow, uh, that has societal values, but is not entrepreneurial and question the impact of students on, on rankings on student well-being. So there has been some research on this in terms of how students at low-ranked institutions or institutions that aren't ranked uh, feel about their, their school. But I've just seen a little bit on that. That's something that I'd like to do more research on. And I think, um, yes, uh, I think that that is it. Um, so maybe I will, let's see. Well. Open it up for questions. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you for this. I, I would like to turn to the audience now and see what questions we have. And um, I'd like to encourage the audience to please continue to ask questions through the question box on the, on the right side of your screen on a um, little area that uh, should be under the word questions. You can also, um, if you can't get your question in the hour, we will answer some of the overflow and follow up uh, social science based posts. Also, you can send your questions in on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag CHTalks. Uh, Michelle, one, one question. You said you're not against metrics per se, but I'm just wondering if you could explain what, it, if we could go get even more fundamental than, than the media's age of ranking. It's like, what is the, what is the role of, what, what is the place of rankings anyway? Can you just, you know, a fundamental question. And the, yeah. again, if you're not opposed to, to metrics, so I assume that you're not opposed to the, the mere existence of rankings, but I, I'm wondering if you, if you could kind of flesh that out. Yeah, well, I think rankings are problematic in that, uh, particularly because they take institutions with different missions and and make them sort of say, okay, we're going to take all these institutions and rank them when they're different institutions and have different missions and purposes, right? And so it becomes a hierarchy. So instead of saying this is a liberal arts school that's doing great work, they get ranked with a school that's doing mainly engineering or STEM areas and then suddenly they're seen as low ranked. Uh, and that just doesn't make any sense. They have different missions, different purposes. So in terms of metrics, I mean, I think part of it is looking at education's contextual. It's, it, it is about community. Universities are in places. And so how do you connect with those places? And how do you make the university relevant to those communities? And, and um, find ways, uh, metrics that look at at how well we're doing that, but also how well we're doing at expanding knowledge um, and talking with people that are often ignored that have so much to offer uh, that are not in the global north. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and in, in since rankings do do exist, mm -hmm. um, and, and I would like to know though a question came in. Yeah. What is you? What what would you project? Uh, trends on university rankings. It, I think you suggested that there might be more and more of them in many ways. Maybe not as, that carry the same gravitas as THE or uh, uh, mm -hmm. or like US News and World Reports in the in the US. But will the trend grow over time, or do you think we're going to see a decrease in the number and their? Uh, uh, yeah, they, it seemed to be growing. I mean, there's 12 rankings, at least 12 that call themselves international or world rankings, and over 150 national and specialty rankings. And so I, I think, um, and, and mo most of these are, are products, right? I mean, they're, they're profit making. Um, and so not all, but many are. Um, so I think part of it is that there's this assumption rankings are here to stay. And really what I want to say is, okay, can we at least have a conversation of what is, what do we see as a good and worthwhile education? What would it look like at least if rankings were not all profit making products? Um, and to have a discussion about that, because I think we've just assumed rankings are here to stay. And maybe they are, but maybe we could at least talk about what are other alternatives and what are other, what are conversations we need to have so we can actually think about, open our minds to other alternatives. And so I think sometimes I, I think about, you know, I used to be working government and communications, and so part of me when I say this is I think, okay, you know, if, if I was back in that position, I'd be like, oh, just give me an answer. If you don't like this, give me an alternative. And I'm tempted. Uh, but part of me is like, okay, our role as academics is actually to say, well, this isn't working so well. It's increasing inequity. It's, it's in many ways impoverishing knowledge. Ha, ha, let's have a conversation about what something could look like that's different. And that's our role, I think, is to open up those new spaces and new ways of doing things. So we have a, a kind of a, co a comment that came in from one of our listeners, and it said students that are coming from abroad, rankings are one of the few ways that they can base their decisions. Yeah. And so, and I, I'm just wondering, it just regardless of the mm -hmm. flaws, I, I think they're, they're going to continue to be used by that audience yeah. and, and by a number of others. Yeah, and so yeah, and uh, th this is another reason I got interested, is almost all my students um, from abroad talk about the rankings which is understandable. Um, I think there, what I would say is, um, is for international students, they, they, is to look beyond the rankings um, or to look at sort of categories um, of universities or the area they want to study. And it does require more work. People did it in the past. And the advantage is this, is that if you just rely on rankings, you can end up going to a place, and I see this often, 
uh, where you're in a class with 400 other people that you weren't expecting. You don't have, you know, you have overpaid or underpaid sessionals teaching you, um, not always, but often, um, and you don't necessarily get the education you really want. Whereas, you know, if I look at where I live, um, my university is a great university, but if I was, if I had an 18-year-old who wanted a small, call a really high quality liberal arts education, I might send them to the local Emily Carr University, right? So, so yes, I understand that, that students go there, and this is where it becomes incumbent upon universities and university leaders to say, how do we come up with alternatives that provide international students the information that they want and that they need, but that's actually based in something other than profit, that's actually based in, in um, some academic rigor, but does provide them the information they need. And the other thing I would say is, is looking at what rankings don't measure. So they don't measure things like inequity or how a university deals with sexual violence on campus, rather large issues. Um, and so I think international students want to look at those things too. And, and maybe they use rankings and narrow down what they're looking at, but then really, really investigate those universities and look at what, what isn't in the rankings but might be really important to you. We'll have a, a couple questions on uh, on some alternatives uh, based on decommercialization and transparency. But I have some, kind of an interesting um, statement here that's coming from the UK, where um, the questioner comes from a Brussels Group University, and there's a and, they, and he sees a paradox in the way that the UK uh, REF, the uh, uh, Research Excellence Framework, impact agenda in agenda is sometimes at odds with some of the things that we see in the rankings. And I mean, REF is essentially is another ranking system, even if it's yeah. not listed in the ranking system. And I, I'm just wondering, it's just, how do we, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. how do it's we, true. How do we put that tension? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think part part of this is the the, the tension, um, and but part of it is who gets to decide what worthy knowledge is, um, and and academics reinserting themselves, or, or and not just academics, but diverse communities reinserting themselves and making those decisions. So yeah, I mean, I hear a lot from UK colleagues about the 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 multiple layers of ranking and accountability um, that have little to do with education and much to do with with profit and privatizing. And so I think, to me, um, part part of it is is for one educating our colleagues and students about actually what's in rankings. When I have discussions about what's what's what what rankings include and don't, and and who runs rankings, there's often quite a bit of surprise. But it has to be more than academics, because if it's just us, then that sounds like you know just complaining and not wanting accountability. Actually, I'd like to see universities more accountable, but to different publics than what the rankings measure. So do you have a, a way that we might decommercialize some of this? And, I, and I'm also, and when I ask that, I'm, I'm also, re I'm personally really interested when you're talking about being able to buy stars. So I'm wondering if you could, <laughs> maybe you could talk briefly about that, but then uh, leverage that to talk a little bit about decommercializing rankings, assuming that that's a good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, well the stars through QS, um, it's a system where universities that may not be in the rankings uh, can buy uh, stars. They go through a process with QS and hire QS or pay QS to determine the quality and I guess to give them stars based on perhaps things that might not be in the rankings. Um, and provide them also often, you know, assistance that um, some of the universities that I've, I've talked to just informally are, are hoping will someday lead to the actually being in the rankings. Uh, so, so yes, they pay for, pay for stars uh, and, and they can use those stars on their website. And so this can lead to, to confusion too. So you can have on a university website, you know, three stars or I don't know why somebody would, yeah, but but the number of stars that they have as part of branding their university as a quality university, and so that that's how how um, how, how the, the 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 QS star uh, program works, to my understanding. Well, that's a pretty overt commercial input. I'm wondering, is there a way that even for the less overt things, is there a way that we can decommercialize these? That we could decommercialize the ranking systems. 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that part of it is being aware of, of the fact that, I mean, this is part of the global education industry is worth about $4.9 trillion, right? This is a huge, huge industry. I had no idea when I started looking at this. And also that these are often very integrated products. So, you know, if you look at um, the Times Higher Education ranking that used to be powered by Thomson Reuters, Thomson Reuters, now they've recently sold, but you know, own the database of science that was used to to look at research productivity insights that was used um, by faculty by faculty university leaders to determine hiring and and promotion decisions, and so these are integrated products that really end up mediating what knowledge is considered worthy and who's considered worthy of being hired or promoted, and so I think that we need to really realize that the core that universities are being commercialized not just in terms of their partnerships with industry but in terms of what knowledge counts and who gets hired and so and that was the real I you know maybe it shouldn't have been but when I started researching this a few years ago the real surprise for me was how much this is influencing those decisions and so I think part of it is being aware of that and part of it is I mean there has been some efforts um, of universities of governments to try and and um, look at their system and help students make decisions about what's available in the education um, system. I mean, Europe has made a bit of progress on that. Um, there are some areas like Carnegie Mellon that categorizes universities rather than giving a one, two, three ranking. Because the problem with that is it often they it's statistically really insignificant the difference between you know 20 and 21, but it can have substantial, sub significant. Um, uh, impacts on an institution in terms of students applying and, and resource allocation. Now, what was the other question you asked me, Michael, was about, yeah, so decommercializing, I think part of it is just knowing how commercial it is, and, and it does require university leaders to act collectively. And so back before in 2000, um, right before the economic collapse in 2008, uh, academic leaders in Canada, in the U.S., and in Asia uh, collectively fought against rankings, uh, but that kind of fell apart um, soon after the major recession. Um, but there was a period where they did gather and say, "This is these are methodologically unsound," and so I think they could do that again. But to decommercialize and to come up with a solution um, that is actually about education requires academic leaders to stand up to rankings, but it also requires faculty and um, to <laughs> look at the contradiction that we may say we don't like rankings, um, but particularly if you're from a top-ranked institution, also the rankings provide um, a boost uh, in terms of ego, but also in terms of resource allocation. But it's a boost that's bad for the education system as a whole. What about the idea of having a, like a student outcome-driven ranking? Would that produce, mm -hmm. would that be at least a little bit more transparent? So the problem with that is it would depend on what those outcomes are because let's say you have a university that, that takes students who are from, um, who didn't receive uh, quality K-12 to uh, education because of cuts in funding in the area they're in and they're low uh, income or working class. They go into university uh, now they and they may be working full time and going to school. So to measure the outcomes if we're just looking purely at, at grades or what job they get after with students from Harvard is, is erroneous because students from Harvard are coming in with all sorts of social capital and economic capital and networks that mean that their outcomes are probably going to be seen as better, in quotes, than the student from the working class university. So we have to be careful about that in terms of, again, not comparing um, apples and oranges in term, and, 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 and looking at what those outcomes would be. Again, this is where it really does come back to community and looking at what does that community want out of that university, what do those students want out of that university, and how to measure success or weaknesses in that based on those um, discussions, right? So, so you know, there, there has to be differences. I mean, that, that sh an education system should be about um, different aims and outcomes based on community and based on the needs and, and um, dreams of those students. So the, the same question I had wondered, uh, had you looked at the Forbes model as something that was either positive, negative, or, or neutral one? Forbes? The fine, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a bit. I, I didn't look at it in the book. Uh, you know, again, if it, 
it's a, a commercial you know, a commercial ranking with narrow, um, I think, I mean, I think there have been some attempts to, to try and look at different aims and different where students are starting from, um, but I haven't seen anything that I would say is the, is there. And I think ranking, just the notion of one, two, three, you know, it is, I mean, you can have many universities that are really, really good in an area, and so why have them, you know, ranked one to ten or a hundred to hundred and fifty, um, when they're all doing well in that area, what, you could class them or categorize them based on their mission and based on what they're trying to achieve. I think Carnegie, you know, the Carnegie Foundation has, has attempted to do that. I would look to that more than I would look to the rankings. So you know, one of the things that you've said uh, a couple times is a lot, a lot of people, most people acknowledge the flaws in the system, but they basically come down to what are you going to do about it? And so here we have a, yeah. someone that's wondering, yeah. They're wondering, do you know of any cases where individuals and or institutions around the world have spoken back to this hegemonic culture? Yeah, um, thank you for raising that. I meant to mention that. Um, Adam Habib, who is the, I think he's the chancellor that, at uh, Wits University in South Africa, and he's been really interesting in, in saying, because Wits is one of the top ranked in South Africa, um, and one of the only highly ranked universities in, in the whole entire continent. Uh, and he's he's talked about you know okay we're up in the rankings but let's not detract detract from what we need to do uh, for the education system and so you know he's not saying you know um, uh, he's not completely dismissing them but he's he's critical of them and he he makes clear that the university is not going to mold itself based on the rankings that they they have to look at the community uh, and what's right for students and so I've looked to him as as one person. Um, uh, a provost, I think, our vice chancellor, I'll have to check again in my book, um, Sandra Harding in Australia wrote a piece in the conversation a few years ago um, that critiqued uh, rankings. I think recently, though, has when they went up in the rankings, I, I'd have to check that. Um, and there, there have also been uh, uh, librarians that have um, pushed against Elsevier, um, which is not, which is crucial to the ranking. So looking at the connection between citation indexes and rankings is really important. So there ha have been some critiques, um, but again, it really requires university leaders and faculty to come together across institutions. So if one university goes out on a limb, and so some have, um, but they've had to be very well established universities, um, but if they, one goes out on a limb and there's no data about them and they're completely invisible in a highly competitive visibility culture, uh, then it's really risky. However, if a number of university leaders, particularly ones in top-ranked universities, uh, work collaboratively to come up with something that was about education, I think we could do that. And so I guess my call is for that, for, for yeah. university leaders to, to actually say, okay, yes, this is not about education, and this, th this is poor research, and we're going to work together um, to do something different, so to come together like they did back in 2008. You've kind of teed up what was going to be the, the, the next question, which is, uh, so there's one thing about speaking back to the culture, another one about co-opting it. So mm -hmm. since most of the data that's being used to generate the, the ranking, well probably all the data ultimately comes from the university, and so much of it is uh, institutional profiles and mm -hmm. publication performance data and things like that. So is there efforts by university or academics to build their, their own ranking system that would address, at least I'm sure all of them would have some sort of flaw, but some sort of system that would address some of the more glaring ones that you pointed out? Yeah. Um, there are some attempts, and there are some attempts too at using like alt metrics. Um, and, and I should say it's not just data from universities, it's also like from the citation management like, um, indexes like Elsevier um, or Web of Science. Um, but yeah, no, universities are co-opted into it. And they spend a lot of money to try and get up in, in the rankings. Um, so I think there, you know, there are there are alternatives. Um, I, I would say, you know, the discussion I'd like to have is can we have? Can we? Is there ways to provide information to to students, to parents, um, that's easy to access, um, but not as um, flawed as uh, giving a numerical rank? And so again, I look to um, categor categories of institutions. Um, multi rank. Um, you know, there have have been some some attempts. Uh, 
to, to do that, and those are still problematic, but um, perhaps less problematic than the rankings I'm talking about, but they're still problematic. And so I, I do think, and I know my, that the, the former communications director, policy director, me says, okay, I know this doesn't sound like the answer, and, I, and part of me wants to give one, but I think it really is having a conversation, at least that hasn't been had in, in the circles I'm in, around what do we see as a good education? How does it connect to community? How does it connect to equity? Um, I think it's the uh, is it the Wall Street and Times Higher Ed is talking about having a ranking that would look at some of these issues a bit more in the the, the future, but still it's looking at who who gets to does, even if we were to look at include equity in rankings and how a university deals with sexual violence, who's looking at that? How are they making those decisions? What perspectives are included in that? Um, what are the assumptions? And I think that's the thing is knowing that, that rankings are about uh, about values and beliefs and about ideologies. They're not neutral. So I'm the editor of the Social Science Space website. You are a blogger for Social Science Space. Uh, one of the things that you pointed out in your prepared remarks was that it's most of what we're seeing is STEM, and we're not seeing a whole lot of HS, humanities or social science representation in, in some of the uh, people that are making the decisions on this. So I have a couple questions based on that. One is that, I, uh, to me, that strikes me as an issue. Uh, just if you would talk a little bit more about that. I do have a couple follow-ups. Yeah, I do think it, it is an issue that it's mainly entrepreneurial fields, right? And so, and it gets back to, you know, who are the rankings um, owned by and then how knowledge is mediated through that, how, how what can, is considered important. Um, is is set by that, and so I do think that that's really important. Um, not just that humanities and social sciences are are not are minimally represented, um, but also that that rankings count English. And so you know most of the world speaks a language other than English for their first language, and um, you know so so that I think impoverishes uh, knowledge in many ways. And just having people from different academic traditions, and that's the other thing too is. You know, in talking to people in in other co contexts, such as India, where it, this focus on the West as uh, as best and the pressure to emulate that and to pay for these expensive products, that's actually taking away from ways of knowing and teaching and learning in that context. And what so, was the other question? Yeah. Well, so the kind oh, of so, so humanities and social sciences. Yeah, so humanities and social sciences, not just in the the global north context, but internationally, is is really lacking, and that's something that's been sharply criticized by a number of academics. Now, they do have there is the social sciences index, but again, um, very doesn't capture a lot. Um, and rankings also the criticism is that they don't. Um, don't capture books. Now there, there's talk that they'll start to, but they, they mainly capture articles and, to, and conference proceedings. And that tends to, again, privilege science over humanities and social sciences. And so then that, that can affect a university in terms of what they prioritize. And so kind of a following up from that, if, is there a reason why majors such as tourism or leisure studies are not ranked, even though they've been around for decades and decades and decades? Sorry, I didn't get that, Michael. Is there a reason? Is there a reason why majors such as tourism or leisure studies are not ranked, even though they've been around for for decades? Hmm. I don't know an answer. I don't have an answer to that. I just Tour yeah. Tourism and leisure studies. Yeah, and I think that we're just using that as kind of a proxy for a, a number right. of uh, emerging fields, or I shouldn't say right. emerging, they've been around for decades, uh, but they don't. They don't factor in at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a number of fields that don't factor in at all. Um, that's one I haven't thought about. But and and that's an issue in terms if if the field is invisible or not counted, what does that do in terms of how the university, how resource allocation decisions are made at the university level or even at the government level? And and this is where some of the research on how rankings are influencing government when education is seen as a product. So in Canada, we don't have a federal minister of education, but you have talk of, of promoting uh, university through the Department of Trade, right? And so education becomes a product, and then what does that do to the system, to the education system? And what does it do to fields that are not ranked, that are not seen as, as promoting the product? 
So here's a, a statement followed by a question, um, and this is coming from one of our listeners. I do agree with your statement about senior administrative staff at universities should re-examine their stance on rankings. However, drawing on this person's experience in the United Kingdom, this might not happen as long as executive positions in, say, British universities are not democratically elected. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think I think that's that's true. Although I think that um, you know it, it is also looking at particular universities that are top ranked um, is really examining how we're implicated in it, and so. Uh, that we might be criti critical, but at the same time know that if we're top ranked, we get more resources and it's a, it's a boost, right? If you can say, oh, I'm from such and such a university. And so I do think a big part of it is, is, is being democratically elected or not, but I also think part of it is having to say, in the short term, this might be good for my university, but in the long term, this is really negative for the education system. And so it does require looking at our contradictions, looking at the contradiction of a university saying they're about community engagement, they're about sustainability, they're about international engagement, and then on the other hand, using rankings that are in many ways antithetical to that. So international engagement becomes engagement with people that are revenue streams. Community engagement becomes people that can provide, that are donors. And so I'm being simplistic about it, but I mean, I, I do think that um, it, it does require looking at those contradictions uh, and looking at the, the short and long term as, um, as well. That short, and, and this is the other thing, there was a university in Canada that branded itself as number one in Canada and the next year they went down to number four and had to rebrand, so the cost of that um, as well. And so I, I, I think university leaders have to look beyond their own university to this, the health of the system. So independent of the changes that, that you'd like to see and, and the critique that you've made, do you think as things stand right now, it's still in the best interest of a student to, uh, in most cases, go to the, the highest ranked university that they can get into? No, um, I don't. I, I, no, it, dep you know, it depends. So if they're an undergrad, right? I mean, if, if, if somebody's an undergrad, I think of young people in my life that, that um, and they go to a top-ranked university, right? It doesn't necessarily mean, rankings don't talk about what the experience is for students or who actually teaches them or what the quality of that, experience, that teaching is. Um, you know, in many ways, I, I remember as an untenured prof being told you're spending too much time, you know, on teaching undergrads, that the fo focus on grad students, focus on, um, on getting articles out. Whereas at, you know, the small little college I started, um, in rural Alberta, um, they were there to teach. That was their job. That's all they did. They focused on teaching and they, they had a pride in teaching. So, you know, I, I look at my own education. I went to two highly ranked universities and two not so high. <laughs> I got a good education in all, but a different, they, they all had different purposes, right? So I think it depends where somebody is in their education, but also what they want to get. Just be, And this is the other thing with rankings is a university, a whole university is ranked highly. Now, a university might be amazing in one area, but not phenomenal in another. And so this is another thing where we have to be careful, because, and, and also departments can change as people move and retire. And um, So you could have, you know, I, I would say to a young person, okay, look at what you want to study, look at who you're going to be studying with, talk to people that are graduates from there before you make a final very expensive decision and it might be the top ranked is is best for you but it might it might not be but this is where we also you know need to in our own conversation to challenge talk of where somebody's previous university where where they went pre previously and and judging um their intellect or their abilities on that so so i guess i i think it just depends it depends on what the goals are of the student and even at the grad level, it depends on who they're going to be working with. Uh, so, I, so I think it's more complex than go to the top-ranked school. I know some people that have gone to top-ranked schools who have been pretty miserable <laughs> and, and not gotten what they wanted out of their education. So I'm going to ask a, a question out of, out of left field, and I mean literally out of left field, and that's about a, a <laughs> unique ranking system that, that's predominant, that's very common in the United States, and that's ranking based on sport. Yeah. And we often think of a, a, a great university as one that has a great football or, or basketball team. 
And I'm just wondering, I don't, really, I don't know if I really have a question here, but I'm just wondering if you just ruminate on that for a minute or two. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets to the obsession with rankings, that we rank everything. And should we rank education like, you know, I, I mean, I like rankings when I'm choosing, you know, a car, but should we use rankings for something as complex as education and is, and is sports a way, um, you know, it's often a very masculine way to judge the, the worth of a university. But it is, again, having a conversation about what do we value in education. Um, but it, and it is, it is rankings as a corporate product. I mean, rankings, you know, ha are major money makers for struggling media outlets. Um, you know, so, so I think that that's relevant as well. Um, the sports, yeah, what do I say? Um, you know, it, it connects to, to, you know, when I said there's, a, there's 150 national and specialty rankings, then there's, you know, hundreds of city rankings and, and um, best student city to live in and sport rankings. And so there's ranking after ranking. And I think we have to ask ourselves, um, are, are we making the best decisions uh, based on that? based on those rankings and what would it look like if we had actually did a bit more work to make those decisions, particularly when they're life decisions. So making a decision about a football team, you know, your university and tens of thousands of dollars based on who has the best football team, well, I guess that's hard for me to understand because I'm really not into football, but um, I, I would hope that we would question that a bit. Yeah, I often wonder if there isn't a little bit of confirmation bias. You, you mentioned that there's 150 or so competitors out there all vying for our attention and our uh, yeah. our ranking time, and, I, I, and and all of these things. And if we're not just finding things, it's just like, well, I I'd rather think I like this university. Yeah. I got look, they're they're top of this list. This list is now of paramount importance to me. This is proof that I've made a wise decision. Yeah, and it, it's also often proof, it's confirmation bias of West is best, right? So this is where, you know, those assumptions about the West as, as having the superior education model come in. You don't see a whole lot of change in the top 10 in Times Higher Ed, QS, or, or ARWU. You know, stand, uh, you, you get Harvard and, and Oxford, and K, it, it doesn't change a whole lot. And so I think there is a bias that's built in, and, and it is a rigged system, right? Is those that are at the top already have a lot of money, a high ranking gets them more money, you know, so, so and, and, more, and more money to be constantly visible. It doesn't mean necessarily that what they do is better um, in all cases. Well, yeah, and it seems to me that the rankings were built around what we assumed, uh, what we already knew what are in our, uh, when I say our, I'm using what quotes around that that we understand what is a, a top-ranked university. So we looked at what they had and said, well, that must be what is a top-ranked university, as opposed yeah. to some of the other metrics that you brought up that might, yeah, you instead know. Of, that yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah, instead of asking some questions about how we came to that in the first place. And I think that's our job as academics, is to ask those questions and to expand public conversations and show that we're relevant to the public so that they actually want to fund us. Um, and that so I think it, rankings can detract from those conversations, from those really meaningful conversations with community. So we're, we're pretty much out of time at this point. I want to close with a yeah. comment that came over uh, on Twitter, and that was, the best way to decommercialize the college rankings industry begins with critiquing ranking methodologies. So mm -hmm. we appreciate what you've done with that. And uh, we also, Michelle, I want to thank you for joining us today. Great. And um, uh, in the coming weeks, it's, uh, we want people to register to expect an email that includes a link to view the archive webinar and the slides. We had a couple questions about that, as well as answers to some of the questions we did not get to today. And I, we got a lot of questions, so I, I appreciate that. And there were a lot of really good questions. And if I did disservice to one of your questions by, by trying to cram in with another one, I, I, I apologize. But it, we did have a lot, and I wanted to get to as much as we, we could. Please stay connected uh, with us on our blog, socialsciencebase.com. And when I say us, I mean both me and our, our guest, Michelle. And uh, for information uh, about upcoming webinars and for future posts from Michelle. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, uh, have a good day. Thank you.